everyone, thanks for watching our EC521 project video. We're group two, composed of Ashley Custer, Denise Ortega, Jeannie Trin, and Minnie Kim. We're here to tell you about root kits and how they work. We chose the DEF CON talk by Lance Butters, an introduction to backdooring operating systems, which provides an overview of installing and utilizing backdoors within the context of having temporary root access to the target's machine. We expanded on his talk by exploring the idea of hiding backdoors via rootkits. Using the conference talk as our inspiration, we implemented a backdoor on a Linux machine and used the backdoor to carry out a fun attack. We'll be showing you the attack in our demo. We also implemented a few things beyond the talk. We installed and hid a kernel mode rootkit, used this rootkit to hide our backdoor, and detected the rootkit on the target machine. We did not implement a Windows backdoor in several pranks demoed in the talk. First, we'll give you some background info on rootkits and tell you what they are and two main types of rootkits seen in the wild. Next, we'll explore one type of rootkit more deeply, kernel mode rootkits. We'll analyze a kernel mode rootkit named KBeast to see how it avoids detection and facilitates attacks. So what is a rootkit? A rootkit is a collection of tools that typically provide three services, concealment, command and control, and surveillance. A rootkit establishes a remote interface on a machine that allows the system to be manipulated and data to be collected in a manner that is difficult to observe. Rootkits are post-exploit tools, typically employed at the end of an attack cycle to retain access of a compromised machine. Before a rootkit can be installed in the target machine, the attacker must have a command interface and escalated privileges to root level. There are several different types of rootkits. The two main types that we will be discussing are user mode and kernel mode rootkits. User mode rootkits modify the source code of operating system executable files or libraries that interact with the kernel on the user's behalf. They target system binaries such as LSPS and NetStat. The attacker overwrites these existing binaries with their own malicious versions. This overwrite can be performed by a simple copy command. User mode rootkits add filtering capabilities to executables so users and system admins receive modified output. For example, the output of a command like netstat can be altered to hide the port that the attacker is using as a backdoor. User mode rootkit detection is trivial. The cryptographic hash of a binary file system directory will change when an attacker replaces or modifies it. User mode rootkits can be discovered easily if the system admin compares the cryptographic hash with known good hashes. In contrast to user mode rootkits, kernel mode rootkits operate at a lower level and don't replace system binaries. Instead, they modify kernel data structures to return false information to the user. The kernel is the part of the Unix operating system that handles CPU scheduling, memory management, and system calls. The user space and kernel space compo components communicate via system calls. This is important to know because a kernel mode rootkit will manipulate system calls to remain hidden and stay persistent on a compromised machine. The system call table is a kernel data structure that contains an array of pointers that map to the memory locations of the system call functions. Hooking is when an address of a system call function is replaced with another. Before the actual hooking takes place, the original system call needs to be stored at another location so it can still be accessed. Kernel mode rootkits typically intercept system calls and replace them with their own versions in order to prevent files and directories from being removed and seen. This figure shows an example of the system call function sysread being hooked. The fake function fake sysread replaces sysread's address in the table. This illustrates the difference of how a user mode rootkit and a kernel mode rootkit alter output to the user. Both outputs will be the same, but they are achieved in different ways. User mode rootkits replace the binary file of a command, and the output is modified in user space. The kernel space components are not changed. Kernel mode rootkits alter output to the user by modifying system calls. This modification is performed in the kernel space, and thus is harder to detect. LKMs are used to add new hardware support or functionality as an extension to the base kernel. These modules are installed and removed during runtime. 
From an attacker's perspective, using an LKM is an easy way to insert malicious code onto a kernel. KBeast is an LKM rootkit that was developed in 2012 by IPsec. We chose to analyze KBeast because it is open source and used for educational purposes. Also, having access to the source code allowed us to do an in-depth analysis of the rootkit and its abilities. The PROC and SysFS file systems are used to provide an interface to kernel data structures. The PROC file system allows users to view kernel level information, such as the list of modules loaded by the system. Reading through the contents of the PROC modules list or running the lsmod command allows users to access this information. It's very easy for kernel modules to hide from these file systems as it requires only one line of code to do so. Line 677 shows how KBeast hides its LKM from the PROC file system by deleting itself from the list. The this module variable maintains a reference to KBeast's LKM and the macro list del init is used to delete the module. In doing so, KBeast's LKM remains active in memory while not being seen by the lsmod or cat proc modules commands. KBeast manipulates the system call table by using the hooking technique. Hooking system calls ensures that files starting with the defined prefix remain hidden and unaltered. This code shows how KBeast hooks the read system call. KBeast fakes the output of the ps, ps tree, top, and ls of commands. In line 239, the copy from user function is used to copy the user's input to the terminal into the kbuf buffer. Lines 240 to 241, the function checks the command name for the current process, which might be, for example, ps or ls of. Line 242 checks if certain strings are in the user input. These strings are defined in the configuration file and, p and can be seen in the config.h code snippet. If any of the defined strings are in the input, it throws an error in the attempt to hide KBeast's running processes from the user. In early versions of 2.6 kernels, the user ID and group ID of a process could simply be set to zero in order to give the process root privileges. Later versions of the 2.6 kernel came with a cred structure that holds all the information related to the privileges of a process. The prepare creds and commit creds functions are used to allocate and store new process credentials. A rootkit can leverage these functions in order to create another cred structure with root privileges, thus giving the attacker's process full control of the system. KBeast escalates privileges by creating a new cred structure. It sets the following fields to um, to zeros in order to gain root privileges for its process. KBeast also includes a backdoor that binds a bash shell to a default port number and is password protected. The port number and password can be configured in the config.h file. The shell provided by the backdoor will execute with specific environmental variables. The most interesting ones are those that are set to dev null, which are bash history, history, and hist file. Dev null is a device file that discards any input written to it and so allows all activity generated from the backdoor to be hidden. KBeast provides a kernel-based keylogger that saves a log of user keystrokes in a hidden directory. The attacker can view everything the target types by using the backdoor and checking the log file. The keylogger records user keystrokes by intercepting the sysread system call. Unfortunately, this method is unstable and slows the system because sysread is the generic read function of the entire system and thus is called whenever a process needs to read from any device and not just from the keyboard. Now we will discuss two tools for rootkit detection, RKHunter and Volatility. One detection method we used was RKHunter. RKHunter is an open source detection tool for Unix machines. It uses a shell script to run various checks on the system, such as searching for hidden files or suspicious open ports. RKHunter checks for known rootkits by searching for the default files and directories they use. In the case of KBeast, it checks for the following files, directories, and kernel symbols. Volatility is the second detection method we use. It's an open source memory forensic analysis tool. It is Python based and compatible with Windows, Linux, Mac, and Android. In our case, it was used with Lime, an open source LKM that extracts memory from Linux and Linux based devices. 
Volatility detects a rootkit's presence by analyzing a memory dump of the current environment. In our case, it detected KBeast's hidden kernel module by comparing the outputs of the sysfs and proc file systems and looking for differences between the two. It was also able to detect the hook system calls by parsing the system call table for out-of-range addresses. This concludes our presentation. Thank you, and we'll see you on Monday for our demonstration.